Welcome to In the Workshop. This is part five, continuing a diabolical model steam engine, making a special new piston and rod to match the tolerances of the original engine. Please don't write in to tell me that I'm doing it wrong. I'm aware of one or two things that I'm doing in this episode, but it really doesn't matter. This piston and rod that I'm about to make needs to fit in with the existing engineering standard of the rest of the engine. Before I go any further, I would like to just put on screen the dictionary definition of the word diabolical. There are a couple of meanings, but this is the informal British version. Disgracefully bad or unpleasant. For instance, a singer with an absolutely diabolical voice. That made me smile because over the years being a recording engineer, believe me, I have recorded quite a lot of singers with diabolical voices. Once upon a time, a family of people came into the studio and one of them wanted to record herself singing a song. And after many takes, I was beginning to despair. Eventually, the lady said, what was that take like? And I said, well, one could say that you have Van Gogh's ear for music. And believe it or not, her reply was, oh, thank you. She obviously didn't know who Van Gogh was. It still makes me smile to this day. Anyway, back to the job. I've trimmed the piston rod to the correct length. You may notice a hole in the end of this piston rod. There's a reason for that. It was already there to start with. And I'm going to use it when I fit a live centre to support the part when I turn the groove. This is one of my homemade, cheap and cheerful tailstock die holders. This was an idea I came up with. It allows me to preload lots of dies into these very cheap die holders, which in turn are held in the correct position by an adapter that I made. This adapter, with its knurled finish, fits on a bar, which in turn is fitted into the tailstock. All I have to do is rotate the die holder, the lathe is in back gear to stop the chuck from turning, and I just follow the progress of the die holder by turning the handle on the tailstock. I've stopped turning the handle and you can see what's happening. This proves the point, even though the die holder is being rotated unsupported, it's still in a perfect position, so when I withdraw the entire assembly by winding the handle of the tailstock, simultaneously winding the die holder off the thread, you can see how my system works. It's very effective, and I spend far less time messing about changing tooling, which to be honest drives me mad. On YouTube, there are many channels now showing people machining pieces of metal, and some of these people are incredibly talented. I take my hat off to them. In my case, I only machine things because I need to, not because I like doing it. There are benefits of watching me working on my channel. Often, I approach things in an entirely different way to a machinist. A few years ago, before I started making these videos, I needed some advice from a professional, and my friend Roger was a professional machinist. Who better to ask for advice? When I explained to him the way I did things, he put his head in his hands, and he just shook his head. When he explained to me the correct way to do it, I thought, well, I don't think my lifespan is going to be long enough. It reminded me of things from the past. My first organ teacher also put his head in his hands, but that was because I was just asking too many questions. I've always been quite highly strung and very speedy in the brain department. He said, stop, stop, enough, go away. All you need is time, you'll figure it out yourself. When I met him a few years later, and I was a professional organist at the time, he said to me, see, I told you that you only needed time. And I said, yes, thank you very much, I appreciate it. I've figured out that in certain things I am quite difficult to teach. And for me, my best teacher is myself. I used to read a lot of books about music, sound engineering, and more importantly these days, model engineering. I would say my teacher of model engineering was a man called LBSC. That wasn't his proper name, that was his pen name and many years ago he used to write for the model engineer. Time to get back to the job. This is a very routine job and I've covered it many times in the videos that I've already made. 
but now it's time to use some Loctite 603 to screw the piston blank onto the threaded rod. As soon as I fitted the piston blank to the rod, I machined it to its final thickness. A quick word of caution, this cutting tool that I'm using is great for big jobs, it's not too good for very small parts because it puts a lot of pressure on the work as it is a negative rake tool. And this tends to make small parts move out of the way of the cutting tool. The piston blank is now just about the right size so I can move on to the next part of the operation, machining the groove. A different camera angle for this part of the job, I'm using a live centre in the hole in the rod which I showed earlier to support the work while I machine the groove. I keep trying the o-ring I'm going to use to make sure that the groove is wide enough to take it. At this stage I'm not being flippant but I'm not using any tooling at all, I'm doing this entirely by eye. The depth of the groove is critical but with this engine there is a tiny problem. The cylinder is not bored to any dimension that I recognise. This o-ring is the closest one that I had to the bore and it's a tiny bit too small. I need to machine the diameter of the groove to exactly the same size as the o-ring itself, maybe a tiny bit bigger. You may be wondering how I can do this. Well, it's quite simple. When I put the o-ring in the groove, I can feel it with my finger, so I can easily tell when the groove is the correct depth for the o-ring. Here, I'm quickly machining the piston to the right size. The piston is purposely machined slightly undersized and this will become apparent when I put the engine back together because nothing on this engine aligns with any other part of the engine. The piston is not exactly what I would call a piston fit but it really can't be. And besides when you use steam grade silicone rubber piston rings you don't want the piston to be a tight fit in the bore. Before fitting the piston ring, I'm using some emery cloth to remove the sharp edges on the groove as well as around the outside. And here we have it, one fairly badly made piston to fit in a very badly made cylinder. If you continue watching this series, when I put the engine back together, you will see how out of alignment some things are. Fitting the silicone o-ring and the first thing to do is to absolutely fill the groove with steam oil. Somewhat miraculously, the piston and rod are a perfect fit in the cylinder. This episode has covered a very important part of this rebuild. And that is it for now. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.